Rediscover God's Word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. This is Real Bible Study with teacher Tom Bradford. Welcome to Torah Class. I kind of want to preface this by saying, put your thinking caps on. And I know that's an old phrase that our younger people have never heard before. But this is going to be technical. And it's necessarily so. In order to read the book of Obadiah, or I wouldn't do it. Now, the book of Obadiah is the shortest book in the Old Testament. But that hardly makes it the smallest when it comes to its importance and its relevance or in its complexity. In Hebrew, the name of the prophet is Oved Yah, which probably means something like servant of God or worshiper of God, some, something like that. Now, the primary subject of Obadiah is a prophecy of doom against the nation of Edom. And while Edom is mentioned in, um, well, rather regularly in a number of the prophetic books, as, we, as, as a nation that's going to suffer God's judgment, Obadiah pays the most attention to it. And even so, as we move through Obadiah, I'm going to incorporate others of the various prophets' messages about Edom to add some much-needed flesh to the bones that, that Obadiah leaves out. Because he is quite aware that earlier prophets had already established the context concerning God's stance towards Edom. And so for the Judeans of his day, there was little need to repeat it because it was already well known. Now, there is a foundational principle that undergirds the, the, the words of, of Obadiah that we're going to see in action in all of the 12 minor prophets. And it is that those who are the people of God and those who are not will each experience different end results in the fullness of time. Those who are God's people will be blessed. They will be delivered. Those who are not, will not. Those who are not God's people may not see their negative consequences playing out in their earthly lifetimes, but nevertheless, these curses upon them will manifest in the everlasting world of eternity that is to come. Now, the Bible is clear that although Edom and other foreign nations are depicted as those who are not the people of God, and thus they will be judged harshly, it is not that a human being must be an ethnic or a racial Israelite to be part of and seen as one of God's people. God planted a special people to be his. The Hebrews that began with Abraham. But he also gave the opportunity for others to join his people or to support his people, if they so choose. We read in Genesis about the mixed multitude of various ethnicities who left Egypt with Israel, choosing to be part of Israel. On the other hand, Paul went a step further, even suggested that not everyone who is ethnically or racially a Hebrew will be automatically accepted by God as part of Israel. 
Romans 9, 6. But the present condition of Israel does not mean that the word of God has failed, for not every one from Israel is truly part of Israel. Now, the point I'm making is that merely being descended from Esau or being part of the nation of Edom did not itself condemn a person to God's judgment, nor did being from any other foreign nation. Obadiah does not make such a claim, nor do the other prophets. Yet since this mere 21 verse oracle of God involve, or rather revolve around the subject of Edom and a great judgment it's facing, it's pretty clear that Edom holds some special significance to Jehovah God of Israel. Therefore, I think it's important to recognize who Edom is historically, exactly where it's located, how it evolved over the centuries, what role it plays in the development of Israel. That way, when we read Obadiah and then we begin to dissect it verse by verse, we'll have the background needed to better understand what's happening and why God's ire is so raised against it. Now, the land of Edom is the most common name in the Bible for this region in the Middle East. And it had, however, other names that includes the field of Edom, Seir, Mount Seir, and the land of Seir, along with a few combinations of the names I just gave to you. There's a fair amount of scholarship that believes that a few times in the Bible, when we come across the name Aram, A-R-A-M, Aram, that typically is clearly meant to denote what we today call Syria. In fact, the context suggests it's a copyist error, and it ought to read Edom. Now, how, you ask, how could Aram be mistaken for Edom? Well, it's because both of these words are only two letters long. The vowel sounds a for A, E, and O are not used in Hebrew. So, Aram is spelled Resh Mem, Edom is spelled Dalit Mem, and the issue is that the Hebrew letters Resh and Dalit look nearly identical. And so it is among the most regular misreadings and copyist errors uh, when Bibles were hand copied, as they were for millennia until around the 6th century AD when, with the invention of the printing press. Now, according to certain Egyptian and Akkadian sources, the name Seir is probably the first name for the region as it was given and it was known by, and it likely occurred no earlier than around the 14th century BC. This means it had this name prior to the time of Moses. The name Seir is likely what residents of that area, and the Bible says they were the Horites, called it, as we find it recorded in Deuteronomy 2.12. Only sometime after the Horites were ejected did these new residents change the name to Edom. Now, the territory of Edom is only roughly defined in the scriptures, and the perceived boundaries changed, changed a lot over time with each new civilization that moved into the area. Further, establishing and describing precise boundaries for nations that we're kind of used to in modern times wasn't possible in the ancient past. Once the area was given the name of Edom, 
The boundaries consisted of the mountain range that stands at the northern end of the Dead Sea. And then on down to the Red Sea, or the Gulf of Aqaba, as it's known by in modern times, to the south. The northern border of Edom was the Zered River, or Wadi el Hesa, as it's called now, which was also the recognized southern border of Moab. To the east, its boundary was the desert, an area that is now part of Jordan. Edom's southern border was what today is called the port city of Elat. There was probably no fixed or well discernible western boundary at all. However, it seems that it very likely extended to what the Bible called the Seen Desert. Kadesh seems to be some sort of western boundary identifier because during Israel's Exodus from Egypt, we read in Numbers 20, 16, that the Israelites asked permission to pass through Edom. And it is recorded that now we are in Kadesh, the town on the border of your territory. Still another place used to help define what Edom considered to be, pardon me, its western border is recorded in Numbers 20, verse 23. It says, as Mount Hor on the boundary of the land of Edom. Now, what is key to understand is that Edom's boundaries were not perfectly fixed or clear. And over time, the territory claimed and occupied by Edom would expand and it would contract. And this was not an unusual state of affairs for nations in very ancient times. Now, the capital city of Edom likely was Bosra, since Bosra seemed to be the richest and most important city in Edom. Now, in this era, era, rather, the thought of a nation having a single identifiable capital city, like a Washington, D.C. or a London, was not universal. Rather, in some nations, a king might simply choose some city where he preferred to live and establish his palace, and it could have been in more than one place. So the government would simply follow him there. Thus, capitals for some nations were more along the lines of what we would call unofficial. And what is rather astonishing um, to realize is that the archaeological findings and research, research show that the region of Edom, long before it was called Edom, was settled. It had a pretty high level of civilization as early as 2200 BC. I mean, this is well before the time of Abraham. But as often happens with these ancient civilizations, either some kind of a disaster befell the people, or perhaps drought, or maybe pestilence, maybe even invaders, and it destroyed that 400-year-old civilization around the mid-1800s BC. And for the next five centuries, that region would remain mostly empty. And it was just a stopover place for nomads. In other words, there was no nation or government or even a city in existence there. Therefore, it was open territory for the next people group looking for a new home to arrive and establish itself. And of course, that's what eventually happened. Now, archaeology tells us that the, at the end of the 14th century BC, there was a renewal of an agricultural civilization among the Edomites, the Moabites, and the Ammonites, and the Amorites, who quickly divided into national groups with better defined territorial boundaries. And these kingdoms all prospered from around the 13th to the 8th centuries BC until their destruction in the 6th century BC, about the time when Judah was invaded and exiled to Babylon. Now, it's informative that our knowledge about Edom 
comes mostly from the Bible. And what we learn about Edom well exceeds what the Bible tells us about other kingdoms that neighbor Israel. This great amount of, the, of material in the Bible about Edom is so very helpful uh, from the historical point of view. Genesis chapter 36 devotes itself to the people who would inhabit Edom. Talks about how Edom got its name, the family relationships involved, and clearly these inhabitants are all descendants of Esau, Jacob's twin brother. Now once the tribes that were descended from Esau moved into the region, they were much like the Israelites when they first arrived in Canaan. That is, they were anything but a cohesive nation. Each tribe had their own territory to control, and so they were masters of their own domain. On the flip side, each tribal prince, well, they only cared about what was his. But in time, kings came into power and then tribes lost their independence. And during this period of tribal princesses and then finally kings, Edom was strong and its borders secured by a string of border fortresses. And these border fortresses prevented nomadic tribes from coming in, to the, uh, uh, coming in from the desert to invade them. And a series of Edomite fortresses were discovered during an archaeological survey in eastern and southern Edom, and also even some in western Edom. There's almost no biblical information in regard to contacts between Israel and Edom during this period of time, except that Edom is listed as among the nations that were troubling Israel. Nations that King Saul fought against at the end of this period. Now, while Edom is certainly a largely arid region, it was not without influence or advantage. Edom's geographical location proved to be strategically important in the ancient world. The region was blessed with valuable resources, particularly copper mines. The city of Timnah was renowned for its copper production, and these mines contributed to Edom's economic prosperity. Edom was also located at the crossroads of key trade routes, which added to its significance and to its wealth. So while the Arab world to this day claims that Esau got the short end of the stick, and that his descendants were unjustly relegated by Israel to a wasteland. That is simply not historically accurate. Now here I want to inject something that we need to keep in mind as we study Obadiah, particularly when it comes to understanding just who Edom was and why they reacted against Israel as they did. And they still do, by the way. And why God reacted towards the descendants of Esau as he did and as he still does. In the book of 1 Samuel, we are told this. 1 Samuel 15, verses 2 and 3. Here's what Adonai Sepha'ot says. I remember what Amalek did to Israel. How they fought against Israel when they were coming up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek. Completely destroy everything they have. Do not spare them, but kill men and women, children and babies, cows and sheep, camels and donkeys. Who is Amalek? Where did they come from? Well, Esau is considered the father of the Edomites, but you see he's also the grandfather of Amalek. And according to the book of Genesis, Amalek was the son of Eliphaz and his concubine, Timnah. Eliphaz was the firstborn son of Esau by his wife, Adah. 
Amalek is the tribal founding father of the Amalekites. Are the Amalekites and Edomites different names for the same tribe? Or are the Edomites a different tribe with a separate lineage to Esau? Although different groups, they are united equally by very close family relationship as well as their primary common desire, the annihilation of Israel in its entirety. Their lives were centered around despising God's chosen people and attacking anything related to them. Edom and Amalek were cut from the same cloth. Esau, who hated his brother Jacob for what he saw as a stolen birthright. It also seems that Amalek was infiltrated by the dreaded Nephilim, the illicit, hybrid, spirit being, human being, people that came from the sons of God coming down from heaven to have children with the daughters of men, in other words, the daughters of human beings. So it ought not be surprising that God singled Amalek out for extinction, and he paid special attention to Edom for his wrath. Now many, if not most, of the Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank today are related to Esau. So it is no wonder that they have this maniacal hatred towards Israel and openly stated intent to kill all the Jews and wipe Israel off the face of the earth. These long relationships matter. Even if the modern people who represent these ancient peoples don't even understand it. Now, because of the constant threat from Edom, King David finally conquered Edom after a decisive battle in the Valley of Salt. And contrary to the usual way of dealing with the other nations of the Transjordan that he conquered, David decided not to leave the Edomite king in power as a vassal, but rather made Edom into an Israelite province ruled by Israelite governors. And his reasons for turning Edom into what was essentially an Israelite province was probably primarily economic. Since Edom had the wherewithal to give up substantial tribute to Israel. And they controlled the all-important trade routes, both overland, the King's Highway, and Maritime, the port of Etzion Gabrielat. Now, Israel's rule by, uh, of Edom by means of governors lasted throughout David's reign, and apparently also through most of Solomon's time, until Hadad, a resident, or rather a descendant of the last Edomite king, rebelled against Solomon. Now, we have no information about Edom from the end of Solomon's reign until Jehoshaphat came to the throne, either from we don't have any information from the Bible. We have no information from any other source. Now, it may be reasonably assumed that after the death of Solomon and the kingdom's quick descent into civil war and finally its division into separate and independent northern and southern kingdoms, and especially after the Egyptian king um, uh, Shishak's campaign in Judah and Israel, Edom finally overthrew the oppressive rule of Israel, and they reestablished itself as an independent kingdom. But it was a kingdom that lasted for only around 50 years. With the expansion of Judah southward in the time of Jehoshaphat, Edom was again conquered by Judah. So later during the time of King Yoram, Edom rebelled again against Judah, regaining its independence. And then at the time of King Ahaz, Edom came under the rule of Assyria as a vassal state. So back and forth, this saga went for Edom. Back and forth. From oppressing Israel to being themselves controlled or conquered by a foreign power. 
Now, towards the end of the kingdom of Judah, in other words, the first part of the 6th century B.C., when Judah was rising up against Babylonian rule, Edom was actually ready to join them in rebellion since they too had been subjugated by Babylon. Okay, the king of Edom sent messengers to a meeting of rebels called in Jerusalem by Zedekiah, king of Judah. But alas, Edom soon showed its historic true colors. And during the invasion of Judah by Babylon, Edom switched sides and sent its troops against Judah. And even though Edom gained so much of the wealth of Judah by piggybacking upon the Babylonians' success and subsequent exile of the Judeans, in just a few years, Edom became the target of Babylon's destruction. And after that, several small nomadic tribes infiltrated the now severely weakened Edom, and the historical residents of Edom turned towards Judah's territory and settled in its only lightly populated southern desert region. Here then is also when due to the Edomites more or less vacating their historical homeland, it led to what archaeologists call the Nabataean Kingdom. So in the 4th century BC now, the Nabataeans, a nomadic, actually just a nomadic Arab tribe, migrated into this now vacated Edomite region and established a powerful kingdom that centered around the amazing city of Petra that has been featured in many movies and it draws thousands of visitors each year to view it. The Nabataeans prospered through control of trade routes, the development of advanced water management systems, and three centuries later, the land of Edom went through yet another great transition. Well, by the first century BC, the Roman Empire had conquered the Nabataean kingdom, incorporating Edom into the broader province of Arabia Petraea. This marked the final chapter of Edom's independent history. The region experienced a slow decline, exacerbated by changing trade routes and economic shifts, and pretty soon the area became known as Idumea. And it retained that same name right on through the time of Christ. Now, it shouldn't go without notice that the infamous King Herod was an Idumean meaning he was really an Edomite, even though he attempted to pawn himself off as a Jew. And as we read in the New Testament, he was hated by the Jewish people because they well knew he came from the line of Esau, from Edom, their historical enemy. And at the same time, time, the understanding of just where Edom was located geographically changed radically from what it had ever been before. Edom hadn't so much expanded into southern Judah as they had just fled to it. And so they lost the part of their territory that was on the east side of the Jordan River. Their main home became the southern Judean desert, and it was during that time that it was renamed Idumea. Now, during those early days of Edom being more or less forced into this shrinking territory in the south of Judah, a substantial change in the relations between the two nations took place in the days of the Maccabees. When John Hyrcanus, at the end of the second century BC, conquered the whole of Idumea, and he undertook the forced conversion of its inhabitants to the religion of the Jews. And the Edomites worshipped a number of gods of nature, fertility, but their main god, their national god, was Kos. So the Edomites were pagans, but now they were being forced to accept the Hebrew faith. And from that time forward, the Edomites, now called Idumeans, became a section 
of the Jewish people. And since King Herod was an Idumean, in other words, he was an Edomite, Idumea served in general as the firm basis of his authority as he quite naturally considered the Idumeans, Idumeans to be much more loyal to him than the Judeans who hated him. Well, the Idumeans, again, think Edomites, participated in the Jewish rebellion against Rome that resulted in the destruction of the Temple of 70 AD. Now, strangely enough, they found themselves in league with the radical Jewish zealots because the zealots were not only fighting against Rome, they were also fighting against the mainstream Jews who were under the leadership of Anan ben Anan. Because the zealots were thoroughly convinced that Anan and those Jews with him intended to deliver the city into the hands of the Romans rather than engaging in battle with Rome, believing that such a fight would be pointless and suicidal. So not long after that, Idumea just fades from the pages of history. And so the long history of Edom seems to largely just go underground and now undetected. But when the will of a line of people is focused solely on going against God's will and against God's set apart people, the adversary who leads them does not accept such a temporary setback as the end of the story. Like a river that can go underground, only to reemerge from time to time. Edom seems to resurface from time to time in history as persecutors of the Jewish people. And no more so than we see today in 2024 as they once again do battle against Israel only this time under the name Palestinians. Now there is no academic consensus as to when the book of Obadiah was written. However, the predominance of Bible scholars place it early in the 6th century BC. At around the same time, Babylon invaded Judah and then leveled Jerusalem. Now, the reason for this date placement is that the prophecy that Obadiah speaks about, when he talks about Edom's role in aiding Babylon's onslaught against Judah, this is the giveaway. And as we wind our way through Obadiah, it's always important to keep in mind that when the various biblical prophets wrote, it was usually in the context of what was going on in their time, even though at least some of their prophecy concerned future happenings. Especially in Obadiah's day, Edom was second only to Babylon as the chief persecutor of Israel. So it's not surprising that it was they who were the focus of Obadiah's prophecy. Now, because Esau's descendants continued to harbor tremendous jealousy and enmity towards Jacob and his descendants, and still do to this day, they used the opportunity of Babylon conquering Judah to move into and take over the southernmost part of Judah's territory since so many of the Judeans either just abandoned their homes to flee from the Babylonian army or they had been captured and hauled off to Babylon. So there were many Judean homes and farms and vineyards that the Edomites simply moved into and they took over. They also were most pleased to block those fleeing Judeans from escaping Babylon's forces by capturing those Judeans that were fleeing towards the southwest and then giving them over to Babylon. Well, the long and the short of it is that Edom helped Babylon to oppress Judah, and so Obadiah prophesies that Edom is going to have essentially the same thing happen to them in return. Now, the thing we must note is that Edom was not being 
severely punished because they accidentally bumbled into doing something to Israel that Jehovah didn't like. You see, it's precisely because they did know better, but they did it anyway. That was bringing God's heavy hand down upon them. See, we find more or less the same fate being pronounced among all the foreign nations that either directly attacked and harmed Israel or aided and abetted or even in some way supported those nations who did attack Israel. Now, remembering that it is essentially the descendants of Esau that are attacking Israel from Gaza today. It doesn't take much more than reading the news headlines to know who stands with Gaza versus who is opposed to Israel and thus what fate awaits Israel's enemies sooner or later. The God principle is simple. It's timeless. It's irrevocable. Israel is God's people. Therefore, to harm, to fight, or oppress Israel, or to aid Israel's enemies to do so, is the same as fighting God. You do not want to be in that position. And as we have discussed in other lessons, The Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek all the way back in the mid-200s BC. This translation is called the Septuagint, and it is the basis for some of the English and other language Bible translations of the Old Testament that we have today. Now, not surprisingly, the anti-Jewish Constantinian Church immediately adopted the Greek Septuagint rather than the Hebrew text, for its Old Testament translation, at least partly because Greek was the predominant language of the Roman Empire, but doing so injected a significant issue, an unintended consequence, if you would, for proper understanding of the prophets, especially because the prophets tend to intersperse Hebrew poetry in their writings. Don't think of Hebrew poetry quite the same way English and modern Western poetry works, where the rhyming of words is its main attribute. Hebrew poetry did sometimes involve rhyming, but even more often the poetry aspect was reflected by using two parallel statements of the same length. Some scholars have taken to call in Hebrew poetry thought rhythm. Wordplay was part of Hebrew poetry. Now, we don't, we don't need to get into all of its nuances. It's only that you need to know that the problem with the Greek translation, the Septuagint, and frankly, many English translations that are even taken from the Hebrew Old Testament, not the Greek, is that Bible translators and teachers did not and do not always understand and grasp Hebrew poetry. And so they misinterpret what's meant by what's said. Now, Obadiah employs much Hebrew poetry. And so we're going to be cognizant of that as we study its inspired words in order to arrive at a better understanding of its intent. Now, so much of the prophecies of doom against Edom and all the nations come together in the concept, concept you've all heard of, called the Day of the Lord, the Day of Yehovah, that the Christian and Messianic world is pretty familiar with. And while the Day of the Lord is not a single event that occurs only once, nor does it represent something that happens in a single 24-hour time period. 
it does always signify an act of divine wrath. It is God's sovereign intervention into the affairs of men to put down the wills of men in order to establish His will. And yet it also reassures those who are truly people of God that they will be delivered and preserved. Okay, with all that, let's open our Bibles. Now let's read the one chapter book of Obadiah. <clears throat> Obadiah. This is the vision of Obadiah. Here is what Adonai Elohim says about Edom. As a messenger was being sent among the nations saying, Come on, let's attack her. We heard a message from Adonai. I am making you the least of all nations. You will be beneath contempt. Your proud heart has deceived you. You whose homes are caves in the cliffs, who live on the heights and say to yourselves, Who can bring me down to the ground? If you make your nest as high as an eagle's, even if you place it among the stars, I will bring you down from there, says Adonai. If thieves were to come to you, or if robbers by night, oh, how destroyed you are, wouldn't they stop when they'd stolen enough? If great grape pickers came to you, wouldn't they leave some grapes for cleaning? But see how Esau has been looted, their secret treasures searched out. Your allies went with you only to the border. Those at peace with you deceived and defeated you. Those who ate your food set a trap for you, and you couldn't discern it. When that day comes, says Adonai, won't I destroy all the wise men of Edom and leave no discernment on Mount Esau? Your warriors, Timon, will be so distraught that everyone on Mount Esau will be slaughtered. For the violence done to your kinsman Jacob, Yaakov, shame will cover you, and you will forever be cut off. On that day you stood aside, while the strangers carried off his treasure, and foreigners entered his gates to cast lots for Jerusalem. You were no different from them. You shouldn't have gloated over your kinsmen on their day of disaster, or rejoiced over the people of Judah on their day of destruction. You shouldn't have spoken arrogantly on a day of trouble or entered the gate of my people on their day of calamity. No, you shouldn't have gloated over their suffering on their day of calamity or laid hands on their treasure on their day of calamity. You shouldn't have stood at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives or handed over their survivors on a day of trouble. For the day of Adonai is near for all nations. As you did, it'll be done to you. Your dealings will come back on your own head. For just as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so will all the nations drink in turn. Yes, they will drink and gulp it down and be as if they had never existed. But on Mount Zion, there will be a holy remnant who will escape. And the house of Jacob will repossess their rightful inheritance. The house of Jacob will be a fire. The house of Joseph, a flame setting a flame and consuming the stubble, which is the house of Esau. None of the house of Esau will remain, for Adonai has spoken. Those in the Negev will repossess the mountain of Esau, those in the Shephelah, the land of the Philistines. They will repossess the field of Ephraim and the field of Shamron, and Benjamin will occupy Gilead. Those from this army of the people of Israel exiled among the Canaanites as far away as Zarphat. The exiles from Jerusalem and Zarphat will repossess the cities of the Negev. Then the victorious will ascend Mount Zion to rule over Mount Esau, but the kingship will belong to Adonai.
I promised you we were going to get really technical. Well, here we go. In Hebrew, the opening words of Obadiah are Hazon Ovadiah, meaning Obadiah's vision. Now, some scholars say it means Obadiah's revelation, but vision and revelation are similar in meaning, so there's no need to quibble over which one's right. Hazon, the word Hazon occurs 35 times in the Bible, with about a third of those occurrences in the book of Daniel. And from a purely generic standpoint, the word means to see something. However, in the prophets, it always refers to the content of the prophetic revelation. In academic terms, this rather standard form for beginning a book is called a superscription. A superscription. And since so many Bible books begin with a superscription, but its relevance is rarely ever talked about or explained, its significance just goes unnoticed by Bible students. So let's briefly delve into the literary use and meaning of superscription as we find it in the Bible. The basic definition of superscription is this. It is something written above or outside of something else. In the Bible, they contain four possible types of information. First, personal names, usually including the Hebrew preposition le. For instance, more than 70 psalms invoke the name David. Some psalms have esoph, that's Psalms 50 and 73 through 83. There are even psalms that begin with the words, the sons or descendants of Korah. We find that in Psalms 42, 44 through 49, 84 and 85, and 87 and 88. The name Solomon is found to begin Psalm 72 and 127. Ethan in Psalm 89. Heman in Psalm 88. Moses in Psalm 90. Again, all these are superscriptions, so we ought to be able to grasp, without being theologians, that it matters who the author of a psalm is. The second type of superscription are genre classifications, such as psalms, in Hebrew that means more, or songs, in Hebrew, sir, and sometimes some very nuanced literary terms like miktam or makil are included. The third type of biblical superscription is about liturgical directions such as lamnesia, uh, meaning to the leader, to the leader. And there are also sometimes included other obscure terms denoting melodies or musical instruments, proper ritual procedures that are be to be performed along with it. The fourth type are references that relate to certain individual psalms concerning David's life. Psalms 3, 7, 18, 34, and a few others. Many of these include technical notations whose exact meanings was of course clear to the writer, was clear to the people of that day, but it's not so clear to us. For example, most of the Psalms are disguised, uh, described in the original Hebrew as mitzmor, meaning a psalm. But this almost certainly included the understanding that mitzmor meant that when the words were recited, they were to be accompanied with musical instruments. A number of Psalms called song, Hebrew, sir, also include more nuanced directions as to exactly what type of musical instruments were to accompany the singing or the chanting, such as Psalm 4. With its note, it says, to the choir master with stringed instruments. Psalm 5, 
with its direction to the choir master for the flutes. There are 55 of these psalms. We also rarely find the word Selah in the superscription. And while there's many educated guesses about the word, the truth is its meaning remains a mystery. The way the Greek Septuagint translated, it's taken to mean a musical interlude, maybe a pause or an intermission. That's highly doubtful. Bottom line, there can be a lot of information in a simple superscription that begins a Bible book. And in the case of Obadiah, we find the author's name, along with the kind or the source, if you would, of the message he's going to deliver. It comes from a vision that he had. Okay? So continuing in verse 1. Following the superscription, we get the words, Thus spoke the Lord Yehovah to Edom. Okay. I prefer not to get bogged down in too much technical jargon. And yet, as with our realizing the importance of what the information of the superscription brings with us, uh, for us, so it is that we need to understand what these next words mean that completes what academics call the messenger formula. So the first part of the messenger formula is that superscription we talked about. Then the next word is the Hebrew word ko, which means thus, in the sense of what follows. The second word is amar, and it simply means spoke. This is followed by the name of the speaker the Lord Yehovah, and then the recipient of the message, Edom. So the messenger formula that we find 19 times in the Hebrew Bible always consists of three parties being identified. The messenger, in this case Obadiah, the sender and author of the message, the Lord Yehovah, and the recipient of the message, Edom. This gives us a very plain understanding of the process by which this communication is occurring. It relieves us of any ambiguity. That is, this is not Obadiah's message, nor is it his words. It is the Lord Jehovah's message. It is the Lord Jehovah's words. And it identifies Obadiah as the authorized person who's to deliver the message. And in addition to the 19 times when God is the one that is sending the message, there are also over 400 times in the Bible when this same messenger formula is used. But in those cases, the sender is a human being. This tells us that the messenger formula was embedded and understood within the biblical Hebrew culture. So, to begin Obadiah, we have the sentence in Hebrew, Hazon Ovedya Ko Amar Adonai Yehovah Le Dom, in English. Obadiah's vision. Thus spoke the Lord Yehovah to Edom. Notice that God's formal name is used. This is not rare. But to the average Bible reader, it would certainly seem so. The reality is, God's formal name is written over 6,000 times in the Hebrew Scriptures. However, English Bibles omit it nearly entirely perhaps allowing God's name to appear a half dozen times on average. Instead of God's name, as it is written, we'll just find it, say, Lord God or Lord. Part of the reason for this is because when we get to the New Testament, we find Yeshua regularly referred to as Lord. 
Thus, the Constantinian church began a tradition of sorts to transfer the office of God from being Yehovah to being Jesus simply by using the word Lord instead of Yehovah and thereby allowing the Christian reader to assume it meant Jesus. If, like myself, you find it important to know which personage or attribute of God commanded certain things or gave visions or so on, then knowing for certain it was the Father, Yehovah, rather than the Son, Yeshua, well, it matters. Okay, there's been a great deal of information imparted in this lesson. I think we'll leave it for today. Okay? For more teachings of real Bible study and to rediscover God's Word with Tom Bradford, visit Torah Class today on the web, streaming TV, or download the Torah Class mobile app.